Salam alaikum. Thank you for coming back after the coffee break. I know that uh, the networking is the, the reason why you're here, so I understand that you are drawn to, to stay outside. Uh, and I, I have good news before we start. Uh, I've been given a very broad topic, actually multiple topics to discuss, but But, uh, so we're talking about higher education, skills, talents, work, the future of work. So there's a, a whole lot of stuff to say, but I got lucky enough that the speakers before me covered a, a large chunk of that. Actually, a, a substantial part of that. So you might think, good, so he will finish early. But uh, bad news, I mean, I'm, I'm a professor. If you cut half of my material, I might barely make it on time. <laughs> No, just jokes aside, I will actually try to, to, to be a bit, uh, a bit faster. Uh, I, I can't possibly cover everything that there is to say about this topic. So I chose to pick here and there a couple of talks that I, I, I believe convey the deeper meaning of what's going on in uh, talent work and higher education. And uh, I'm going to start with something that reminds me of my, my childhood. <laughs> When I was a, when I was a kid, uh, the, basically the, the cool thing to become when you grow up, so what every one of my friends wanted to become, was an astronaut. And, uh, and why not? I mean, this happened in 1986. I was six then. And, uh, and this was a shuttle taking off. And after years, decades in fact, of invest, uh, investment, training, practicing, developing new technology, simulating things, after decades of that, spending money with a vision of conquering space, this happened on the 28th of January, 1986. This is the, the, the Challenger shuttle taking off from Cape Canaveral, Florida. In an early morning, it took off with a high expectation. And within less than two minutes, it crashed. So seven crew members died immediately. Millions of dollars of investments went to the water, dis disappeared. And obviously, the mission for which all of these investments had been done was never achieved. How's that possible? I'll tell you what happened. A little single plastic O-ring worth probably five cents failed. In fact, two of those. And they failed because the temperature on the day of, the, of launch was a bit lower than expected, so they failed, they released the fuel, and within a minute and a half, the fuel exploded, destroying everything. How is that possible? Billions, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars went to waste because a single little piece of plastics worth five cents. What does this say about the future of war? What does it say about us? Well, a few colleagues. I don't know what's the best way to, to, to use the mic. Uh, can I ask you to have a, either a label mic or, or another mic, whatever, so I can move a little bit? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. So what does this failure say about work? There's a, there's a couple of colleagues uh, from uh, uh, Professor Kramer from Harvard University and uh, Professor Otto from uh, MIT. Thank you. Can you hear me? Oh, fantastic. Um, so they, they see this experience as a very powerful metaphor for, for the world of work. So pretty much, what we do, what we produce, what we manufacture, happens as a consequence of a sequence of steps. Multiple tasks have to be lined up so that eventually we have a final product. You see this, uh, this slide over there. Now, if these tasks are performed poorly or in a poor same sequence. So for example, if the engineers at NASA had been so-so, or if the astronauts had not been very well trained, or the shuttle poorly designed, the O-ring would have not mattered because the launch would have failed anyway. The difference is that when everything else is of very high quality, it's enough to lose this high level of quality in a minor component to undermine a big amount of worth, of value. 
So that's what happened with the with the O-ring. And what this what makes this very interesting is that in most of the jobs of the future, man is the O-ring. You are the O-ring. You may be doing less than you used to do because you're surrounded by robots and algorithms and artificial intelligence. The problem is that robots and algorithms and artificial intelligence are really, really good. They don't really make mistakes. They are designed to work consistently at a very high level of performance. And there, just a little mistake from one of you would undermine the massive investment that goes into developing these new systems. No pressure there. Now, we've heard from, uh, from the previous speaker that uh, some of these systems and these technologies already exist that can replace us. They can automate our work. Half of the tasks we do can be automated. But again, my job entails multiple tasks. I prepare lectures, I give lectures, I prepare midterms, I grade midterms, I prepare talks, I give talks, I take attendance, I do so many tasks. Not all of these tasks can be automated. Half of them, yes. But how many jobs can entirely be automated? Right now, 5%. 5% means that your job is not going to be automated, most likely. Nor is mine. Mine is not going to be automated for a long time, apparently, which is good news. But uh, one of the things we know is that the majority of jobs can be automated for one-third of the tasks. Now, that means that the nature of your job will change. That also means that when you automate a bit of your job, your job will be performed by two entities, yourself and a computer. Now, how can we design a system such that humans and computers work together in a way that they achieve jointly what neither can achieve individually. That's a big challenge. I'll give you a quick example because I'm sure all of you know about it. Uh, if you've been a student in the recent past or if you've done some desk research, you will probably have used Wikipedia quite extensively. Now, Wikipedia is a combination of creating new content and vetting the content to make sure that it doesn't violate, it's not plagiar plagiarized, it doesn't violate certain code of use, it's not uh, uh, unsafe for work, and all these things. Now, how hard is it for a computer to create content? Right now, it's almost impossible. That's why men do it, and women, of course. How hard is it for men to check if something has been plagiarized? It's virtually impossible nowadays. That's why computers do it. So the combination of the two creates a new form of value that was impossible for the two separately. But that's just the beginning of it. What is the role of men, of humans, of people, in this new collaboration? We do a lot of things. We do create software, so there is a part of creativity and coming up with new ideas. We select what's the best application in different contexts, so we have a decision-making role. We fix problems. We express judgments. We say, this didn't work, let's fix it. And we do things that only humans can do, like uh, sympathizing or those activities that require personal, interpersonal skills. Now, I'm not going to talk about it at all, but the two bottom uh, bullet points, the yellow ones, they specifically refer to the role of humans in machine learning. Nowadays, when we talk about artificial intelligence, it's all about machine learning. But machine learning is not about the machines. It's about the humans that create the machines. It's about the humans that provide examples and the machines that learn from these examples. It's humans providing feedback. So the role of humans is still critical. But this you all know. What about the role of technology in the future of work? What does technology do when it shares its, uh, our tasks or our jobs? There are different ways to look at this. You know, technology sometimes is just a tool in our hands. I came here, I was driving here, in order to avoid getting a kind of fine, I, I set the, the cruise uh, control on my car, so that's the technology doing what I told it to do. 
The technology nowadays does more. Who has been on the phone with an airline company recently? Just one? I'm sure there's more. Have you tried to upgrade or change or book a flight on the phone? So you would probably know the experience of listening to a, 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 a tiny little song in a loop in the background when they put you on hold. Because you say, I'm going to fly from Abu Dhabi to London on such and such day. They say, OK, can you please hold on? I'll put you on hold. They put you on hold and you listen to this music while they, they Google the, the available flights. Because it takes very long for a person to do. Now, there are companies that don't do that, airlines that don't do that anymore. KLM is one of them. So when I ask, or when I'm on a chat with uh, the operator, and I say, I need a flight from Abu Dhabi to London, the, there is a bot that automatically suggests all of the available flights. So the operator is on the phone with me, and there's an assistant, not a human being, a digital assistant, making his job easier. That's brilliant. There are other ways to collaborate. Sometimes machines are not assistants, they're real peers. They do the same job as we do. For example, um, if you, there's, a, there's a, an insurance company called uh, Lemonade. When you have an insurance claim, you send it through and an artificial intelligence algorithm will approve your refund on its own. Unless it's complicated. When it's complicated, we call in a man and the man checks. Otherwise, the system does it on its own. When you buy uh, multiple items from souk.com or from Amazon, uh, how do we make sure that the exact amount of the right items are in the box? If you ask a man to open all of the boxes and check it, it'll take forever. So what we do instead is that there is a, a scale, a weighing scale, it checks the weight and makes sure that the weight of the package corresponds to the weight of the items in it. If everything is alright, it goes through. But if there is a mismatch in the weight, then a human being is called in and says, can you please check it? Because machines can't do that very well. And so far, I'm still telling you things that we're quite comfortable with. I'm going to show you a little clip about this in a moment. But I have another question. What's your job? Is anybody HR, for example? Finance? Academia? Academia in order. <laughs> so I'll make this example about uh, academia. Let's, let's play in our own turf. I'm an expert academic. I've been, uh, actually, I, I just uh, realized that yesterday Facebook reminded me that yesterday was the 10th anniversary of my PhD. I suddenly felt very old, but I also feel experienced. So now I know my, my trade and I can make decisions for myself. So what if someone came to me and said, you know what, the material you're teaching is awful. First reaction, and who are you? <laughs> if you're in HR, what if Dr. Alessandro comes to you and say, you know the person you hired last week? Terrible choice. The person you promoted, oh my God. And you would look at me and say, and who are you? What do you know about it? Fair enough. What if an algorithm told you so? What if a computer told you that your professional assessment after 15 years or 20 years of doing your job was terrible? What are you going to do? When AI performs a role of a manager, the nature of work is going to change, but also the nature of workers is going to change. We're going to skip a little, a few things because I, I know that we're running a little late. And I'm going to go and start talking about how do you prepare for this work that's changing? And how do universities prepare you for this work that's changing? First, you would like to know what kind of work people are going to do. So when I was a kid, I wanted to become an astronaut. There's a, a number of things that an astronaut needs to know. And you can train them. However, unfortunately, for a child born today, what we know is that in his life, he or she would perform seven different jobs. So you have to train them with seven jobs. That's an, an interesting challenge. But what makes it a real challenge is that five of these jobs do not exist yet. How can you train someone for jobs that don't exist? Now, some of my colleagues at, uh, at the World Economic Forum um, I'm sure many of you would have seen this, right? It was over social media for a very long time. And I want to point out a few things. This is a very interesting list of the skills that you would have needed
to be successful in your job in 2015 and those that are expected to be necessary two years from now. So many of the skills you have over here, over here in 2015 are skills that relate to what makes humans different than machines. And this is becoming even more so. So the things I mentioned earlier, making complex decisions, emotional intelligence, problem solving, some of them we've dropped. You don't need quality control anymore because machines do these things nowadays. And I can tell you that in just five years, 20% of the most important skills were dropped and replaced by something else. But don't think it's that easy. Because the nature of problem solving is different than it was five years ago. We can call it the same, but it's an entirely different skill. The world is changing at, at an exponential speed. So the skills you need to keep up with it change at an exponential speed as well. When we talk about uh, emotional intelligence as a critical f uh, uh, skill for 2020, what does it mean compared to what it meant in 2015? Emotional intelligence means understanding each, other, uh, understanding each other, talking to each other, persuading each other, and even understanding yourself. But the way we communicated five years ago is completely different. So how do you upgrade emotional intelligence to the digital era? It's a different skill. And I added a few more that I believe are especially important. Digital readiness, in particular, is the one I believe is always left behind. Emotional intelligence will help you when you have to work with human colleagues and human bosses and human assistants, not when your boss is an algorithm, not when your assistant is an algorithm. That requires an entirely different notion of interactions and collaboration, for which, I'm sorry to say, no one is ready. Not even me, <laughs> though I'm here to talk about it. Another thing we know is that Half of the things you learn in your first year at college are obsolete by the time you graduate. That's a lot. Let alone the things that become obsolete three years in. I'm not proud of that, but it's a matter of fact. And it's not my fault. It's not our fault only. It's the fact that the world is changing at a higher and higher speed. So, what I'm going to do now, I hope I, I, I'm on time just to, to wrap it up. I'm coming to the conclusion. Was I good? Thank you. <laughs> what I'm going to do now, I'm going to wrap it up very quickly, and I'm not going to give you any advice or any recommendation. I will just leave it uh, fairly open-ended, because I know that there's a, a round table coming next, and I think that these are some of the issues they will pick up. So it's a sort of a pending conclusion. But there's uh, some things that I've said so far that I'd like to, to review before my final slides. So what I've been saying so far is that we're going to work more and more with machines. The better these machines perform, the more important our human contribution becomes and more critical. In order to do this, we need to have unique and increased skills. But the skills we have constantly become obsolete. They become obsolete all the time. There are two things here. Obviously, one of them is that you have to keep acquiring new skills. That's the easy part. How do you perform at a very high level in your job? You probably use skills that you've been able to refine and become an expert of over a decade. What if you never have a decade? What if anything you, and everything you learn becomes obsolete before you become an expert? How do you perform your critically important role in an interactive system between humans and machines without being as good as the machines. How many of you would feel comfortable being fired by a machine because simply you're not good enough? Now, I'm not suggesting that that's the case, but I'm just, want, I'm just trying to provoke a sort of an uncomfortable feeling in you because uh, what we're here to offer as a university is a forum to reflect on these things. We're not here to preach solutions, although we've been doing this traditionally for a very long time. We're here to invite you to have a conversation because you might have the solution. I mean, we might be able to research it and we might be able to spread it around. 
So that's our function as an, as an educational institution. There's a couple of things that obviously uh, we cannot avoid, and I'm going to mention them briefly because they, they are part of this conversation. So one of them is that education and learning needs to be available throughout your career at multiple stages in life. It can't be a one-off event. Because the skills we traditionally teach become obsolete so fast, we should probably stop teaching them the way we used to. Maybe we can teach you, well, not you really, but our students, how to solve the problem. Let's give you a challenge for which you're unprepared or ill-prepared and teach you how to find the right questions, develop the right skills to address that specific problem. Because that's what you're going to need. That's what our students are going to need. Understanding the gaps in their knowledge, filling them up, and come up with solutions to real problems, not multiple choice questions. Although I'm a big fan of MCQ, that will also have to change. And there's another thing, I believe, that makes us, a as a university, a partner to this conversation. I know the, the metaphors about uh, the industrial era are a bit uh, aged and not really up to date anymore, but uh, if you allow me to use one of them, I think that we need to stop considering our students as clients, that we need to attract, sell them something, keep them, keep them pleased, and then send them off. That's not what we as a, an educational institution are here to do. What we should do instead is to treat them as our product. You are our client. Society, companies, industry, government, you are buying from us a citizenship made of talented, grown-up adults that can perform critical tasks in your organization. And you should pay for us, not the students or their families. That would change the right type of incentive for us to deliver the right students for you. But I'm not here to ask for money, so don't worry about it. I don't know how I'm doing with time. I'm, I'm, I'm really just going to, 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 to come to the conclusion that the, the, the invitation is for you to attend and contribute to the round table that's coming uh, uh, in a few minutes and uh, to come and talk to us, any of us really, to see if there's anything that you can share with us so that we come up with, together with a better idea of how to address the problems that I've been speaking about. Thank you very much.